once we started looking at that in that way, it wasn't like finding a news article that said, file a class action against some company. It was finding a lot of information, clustering it together to find an event, and then understanding what was the legal value of that specific event. Right. Welcome to 20 Minute Leaders. Just sit back, relax, and learn from the leaders of today. It's a journey. Each one is different, unique, inspiring. Let's get started. This episode is powered by J Ventures, a community-driven VC fund in Silicon Valley, in partnership with Lomitech, and sponsored by Homeward Ventures, Hippo Insurance, Upwest, Hillel at Stanford, Leap, and Birthright Excel. Hello and welcome to another episode of 20 Minute Leaders. This is a very, very special episode. It is being released with some really amazing announcements about this company. Meet Eviatar Benarsi, co-founder and CEO of Dero AI. Eviatar, or Evia, is the co-founder and CEO of Dero, an AI startup on a mission to uncover injustice. Evia served as a combat officer in a special unit of the IDF and later on went to study law and cognitive science at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. He clerked at the Israeli Supreme Court for Justice, Uzi Vogelman, where he met co-founder Elad Spiegelman. Evia is also one of the founders of Yahav, an Israeli youth movement for social change, teaching young activists about the democratic values of Zionism. Evia Tarbenazzi, welcome to 20 Minute Leaders. Thanks. Thanks for having me. It is um, quite unique that I get so excited about a company. Uh, I am honored to be a small part of it from, from the get-go, but just understanding what you're doing and following your journey, and not just what you're doing, but the social impact journey that you're on, doing it in a very non-conventional way, that, that's really inspiring. And that's what I want to talk to you about in these 20 minutes. I want to understand you better. I want to understand Darrow better and how you're using deep technology to make significant changes in the world where technology didn't really exist before. Yeah, well... First of all, again, thanks for having me, but I think like the issue with doing something inspiring or something like that, I think we just started out with trying to do something, right? Um, we, we were looking at this world where a lot of legal violations existed, um, issues where companies or corporations were harming a lot of people um, by doing something illegal, uh, like privacy breaches or environmental uh, uh, acts that were polluting or contaminating the environment. And, and we were thinking about that and saying like, gosh, how many cases are there in the world that are never detected and never really reach court? It, 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 it shocked us. Um, and then once we saw that, then we said, well, it, maybe this is a dramatic moment. We should change the way that we're thinking about this. So it all came to be when I met Alad, my co-founder and COO at Darrow, um, we, we met together in law school, actually. He interviewed me to the law review. Wow. Um, and, and he made that mistake of, of accepting me <laughs> in, okay? Um, but once he accepted me, then, then we got to that position where we were thinking about the same problems, kind of like he's this like macroeconomics guy, you know? And um, we thought about a lot of problems that were like near to the justice area. Right. Um, now, is this in the context of starting a company? So you're in law school. It's not that traditional for somebody who's in law school to be thinking about problems at a scale of what a startup might look at them. Is that the intention that the two of you are engaging already? No, I, I really wanted to be like a public attorney. Um, wow. I, I really didn't think about like starting a startup at all. And I think a lot didn't as well. We did have some thoughts about the world of tech and how law wasn't like progressing enough. But it wasn't that we were thinking about starting a company. And we, like, th the best evidence for the fact that we weren't was that we both went to clerk for the same Supreme Court justice, like on the track to being lawyers, right? Um, and, and we both became lawyers. We both took the bar and we both worked as lawyers. Um, but during our time in court, I think there was one like point where everything changed, like that singularity point, right? Um, where I brought a whiteboard into our like office. We had an office together. We would sit about 16 hours a day together. Um, I, I, I think today I have more hours with a lad than his wife, Yael, sometimes. So we're, we got really close. And then we started looking at that whiteboard and everything that we were seeing in court was like, we would see many cases a day and we would dismiss most of them. But on the outside, when you just sit on a break and look at your phone, you're like, 
There are a lot of legal violations. They're untreated. They don't get to court ever. Most victims of illegal action don't really get their day in court. Right. And so we had that thought of like, these cases should come to court somehow. We started drawing uh, uh, on the whiteboard the problems. What are the bottlenecks? What, what's making like those cases outside that information not get to court? To the Supreme Court, right? There's a lot of instances in the way. Um, and once we met Gila, we understand that this was like a problem of intelligence gathering. So Gila is this, she's our CTO. Um, genius. She's a genius. Yeah, she's a genius. And, and when we meet her, I think she was 24 at the time. She just got like released from the army. She was a software developer and data scientist. Uh, she was in the Mamram course before that and then got to the A200 unit. When we were in the officer's academy together. Yeah, yeah exactly. So we meet Gila and, and she's like, I like this idea because I have the feeling that it's going to like a social impact kind of place. And that's the kind of startup she wanted to do. So we got connected over ideology. But at some point, we start talking and we understand that there may be a technological solution for the problem here. Um, so, so we start working on something that was very primitive, um, but it was this data pipeline that allowed us to find new information about cases that were never brought to court. Right. Um, and when I mean a case, then the first thing that we saw was like this huge data breach, a massive data breach in Israel uh, that just no one sued over. So why is that? How do you explain a situation it's 2021. All of these tech companies, they obviously have all these personal information about us. There's no real control over how they're being disseminated. And we're observing that we have data breaches. And obviously, this is illegal. Why aren't we seeing it in court? Where's the bottleneck? So we thought the bottleneck at the, at the get go, we thought the bottleneck was that people were not seeing the information. Then later on, we learned that it wasn't that the evidence wasn't online. And it wasn't that people were not seeing it. They were just seeing bits and pieces of it. The problem is that you don't have like, no one's shouting at you a coherent factual story saying this company had a data breach in this state and that's wrong because of that law and therefore it should be sued. There's no information like that out there. What you really get is a URL with some information about the company in some place and another URL where you see, oh, they just released this product and another URL where you know, oh, this product doesn't have a password gate and another URL where there's some information about the problems of the data and how sensitive it is. And, and combining all that information together, fusing that data from different data sources, getting to one factual story that's coherent and people could actually read and take action upon that was the problem. Once we started looking at that in that way, it wasn't like finding a news article that said file a class action against some company. It was finding a lot of information, clustering it together to find an event and then understanding what was the legal value of that specific event. Right. That makes a lot of sense. Now, if, if we look a little bit broader and we're looking at Darrow as, you know, with the vision, you know, how many, how many people are you at Darrow today? We're 43 today. Holy crap, 43 today. I think when we met, it must've been like 10 or 15. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. Where's the vision at? Where, if you're looking at the legal world and Darrow and the social world, where, where are you headed? Yeah, so, well, I do wanna say that like on the legal side of things, we started looking and said like, we don't wanna be another legal tech company. We don't right. wanna make the process that attorneys are going through um, in their day-to-day -day lives more efficient. We want to bring justice to the world. Uh, that was the vision. So the sounds vision, simple. Yeah, it sounds <laughs> simple, right? So the vision for us is creating a world of frictionless justice. We were looking at the world justice. and saying like, wait, we have people. People are electing officials. These officials are making law. And that law is supposed to spill on reality. It's supposed to become reality. But to do that, you need enforcement. We don't have enforcement. It's not optimized at all. Right. So we want to optimize that justice economy to make it so that we actually get all the cases that should be filed to court to court and we get them resolved as fast as we can. So the mission for Darrow is to find every legal violation and resolve it. That's what we're doing today. And, and the methods that we're using are methods of building a data platform for lawyers, for litigation professionals, that could actually use that platform to source new cases, 
share them inside the firm, and then take them to court and act upon them. And also, like the major thing that we, we discovered during this is that you need to underwrite these cases. You can't just like bring someone a case, right? You need to actually tell them what's the action going to bring here? What it, can you quantify justice in a sense? So you want to tell them this is the damage caused to people. This is the probability of success in court based on previous case law. And this is what you're going to make in some kind of probability. If you show that to attorneys and you get them enough cases, they can make their model more stable and they can bring in a, a steady stream of cases to the firm. And I imagine that until now, the real way to do this would have been intuition. People that have had you know, years of experience with seeing perhaps hundreds of legal cases, well, here long comes there and now you're seeing you know, thousands or hundreds of thousands of cases and you're able to then make the, quantify the potential outcome versus also the probability or chances of success. Where's the impact side going into this? So how, so, you know, well, going back to Gila's motivation to come here, but what is that about? So the, the North Star for Darrow is how much money we bring to victims, right? We want to make it so that victims of illegal action get back what it is that was taken from them. It could be well-being, right? right. It could be that, that someone took your right to, to live with clean air and, or clean water, but it could also be money that was actually taken from you. Uh, whether it is that you bought a product and didn't get it or got like a defected product, it doesn't really matter. But the issue is that we want to get that money back to you or that well-being back to you. And the way to quantify that in a capitalistic society <laughs> is money. Right. So we're measuring how much like fraudulent transactions, if you will, we're, we're discovering on the market and how much, many of them are we getting to attorneys that could do something about it. Right. Um, once we get the case to court, then we also help the company or, or the law firm in a sense. We help them build their case and get it resolved as fast as possible. Through the data platform. Yeah, through the data platform and through our actuarial support of settlements. Mm -hmm. Right. That makes a lot of sense. Now... This episode is going to go out after a lot of the a lot of the great announcements. So I'm going to allow myself to talk a little bit about that and the growth of the company. You're mentioning that untraditionally, you started you kind of started Darrow without knowing that you're going to start a company. You sort of came together with a lot and you ideated through what are the bottlenecks, and then you realize that okay, there's actually an opportunity, and then along along comes Gila and 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 brings the technology side, and you're building a great company. Where does the North Star for you as a CEO, as your entering the Hajjaj Towers every morning, and you're opening the office. Where, where, where are you at? So I think when, like, some introduction to this, uh, we, both Elad and I, and, and also Gila, actually, we got into this whole world through this um, thought of, of how we look at people and what kind of corporation do we want to build? What kind of company? And when we looked at that, we, we, we sat together on the beach, I think it was August 2020, Wow. We thought about a company that was going to be human centric in the sense that we want to like our mission in the world is to find every legal violation and resolve it. Why do you solve legal violations? Why do you want to bring justice to the world? It's because you think that with justice, people could be themselves, mm -hmm. could be whoever they really want to be and, and be the authors of that life story that they're telling. And we thought, well, we're going to do this in the outside, right? We're going to help victims of illegal actions resolve their problems and, and live the and life that story. they want, tell their story. But we also want our employees at Darrow, we want Darrowers to tell their life story. And in that sense, I think my mission as a CEO is to make sure that the employees at Darrow are 100% into telling their own life story. They're authentic. They bring themselves to, to the place of work. And, and they live a life that they're happy about. If that's true, then I think everything will be true. Like sales, marketing, um, we'll get the number of cases that we want. Production would be good. R&D would be good. Engineering, everything would be amazing if everyone at Darrow were feeling that they could be their real self and they were on this dramatic kind of journey into their lives. And all those journeys combined, all those stories are the Darrow story in a sense. Right. Our stories are our story. How do you measure that KPI? How do you go to sleep at night knowing that I am building a company whose culture is human-centric, bottom-up approach for, you know, for justice within Darrow? How do you, how do you even go about th resolving, okay, am I actually doing a good job here? It's hard. 
first of all, I'm not sure that I have like one KPI that could really be the best for this. It, it, it's hard to find one. Um, when we tried quantify it in the first like iteration here, then we said something like, let's check the net promoter score. We'll ask employees mm -hmm. uh, exactly what- promoter score of Darrow within Darrow. Yeah, within Darrow. We'd ask, would you recommend uh, um, Darrow as a place of work for a friend? Right. Friend? Um, and, and we ask that and we get results from that. And, and they're high, of course, and that's how I know that, that things are going in the right direction. But right. I think the major thing that, that we need to do is discuss this, discuss our culture and make sure that people from within are building it and not uh, like this top down approach of building a culture where we want every event, we want every value to be uh, um, manifested by the employees at Darrow. We want people to build what it is that we're doing here in the sense that they feel ownership on culture. I think a lot of the time when I talk to like fellow CEOs, uh, fellow C-level people from, from companies, culture is, is discussed as this leadership issue. Right. And, and we don't believe that. We, have, we had an offsite like two weeks ago for, for the executives. And our thought was like, let's talk about culture. The conversation started with everyone in the room agreeing that we can't make any decisions about culture. <laughs> we could talk about it. It's nice. But we could decide about a lot of other things as executives at Darrow, but we can never decide anything about culture without everyone that's involved being a part of the decision. Because right. deciding things about a company's culture means that you are the culture because you're building that story. And we want everyone to bring their own story into that Darrow story. I love it. Take me back a little bit about Evia. I want to learn a little bit more about you. Yeah, sure. Um, born and raised in Israel, grew up in, uh, in, in Herzliya, but actually in, in the nearby kibbutz, Gililia. Um, and I was this, like this Yeled Chutz, an outsider kid in the kibbutz. So that usually means that you get the feeling of um, you're different from, from your peers, but also you come from a different culture. So my parents were capitalist pigs. And, and the people at the kibbutz were uh, uh, some sort of socialist. Um, of course, it, it has changed uh, um, right. with the years. But, but yeah, definitely it, this, this like, differentiation between the places that I grew up in, that duality, that normative duality of two types of, of social structures brought me to think about social structures like very early on. And I was a very annoying child, I think, by the age of five or six. I would ask a lot of annoying questions that made me, I think, into the person I am today. And you can see how that transforms into law. Um, right, yeah, 100%. And the whole reason that we were the kibbutz for the first place was that um, my parents were both in the military and they needed someone to take care of the kids until late at night. So uh, when, when my, my father retired from the army, a few years after, we just went back to the city and, and started studying there. And, and that was something entirely else because you would think that you go back home, right? You're, you're from the city, so now you, you go back to the city and everyone's supposed to accept you as part of it. But still, there's something about that that people feel like, well, you're from the kibbutz, you, you didn't study with us earlier. Um, and, and that difference made it so that I understood that that outsider position was something that I would hold for a long time. Um, and then I, I went to the army, I went to Givati, um, and, and same happened there. Most of my team were religious, so we had this like a, issue of also being like the, the guys that w were secular, right. had that feeling of, okay, we are, uh, we are part of another culture. Right. We're the minority here, which is funny because most in Israel, secular people are not the minority. Um, and then that brought me again to think about culture and inclusiveness. And then I, was, I had the privilege of being uh, part of the founding team of, of a unit called Ramon. Um, I, I got there a bit after it was founded and, and had the chance of building the culture there wow. as well. And that was also something that taught me a lot about being included, being part of the unit, 
And uh, I think I, we can do a whole episode just on the funding of Rimon. This is amazing. Yeah, it was, it was amazing. It, it, this was a desert commando unit um, in the border of Sinai. It, it was very interesting. The operational uh, uh, things were interesting, but also I, I think building a culture there was interesting. And uh, yeah, I can talk about it for hours. And then later on, um, I, I went to study law and cognitive science, and I, I fell in love with law. But it also reminded me a lot of tech because law had that promise of authorship of your own life story, right? We'll give you all your rights and you'll just decide who you want to be and you'll be free to be whoever. And, and tech had like information technology had the same kind of promise at that time. I grew up on Windows 95 and it was all about that, right? It was like, we'll line up all the windows for you and you'll decide who you want to be. Um, and, and it took me a few months to see that because of the interference of capital, uh, both promises were not really real. Um, law was being controlled and still is controlled by capital. Um, and so a lot of the people that don't have enough money just don't get to whatever it is that uh, it, it seems to be justice for them. Um, there is this justice gap, which is a, a capital gap. And the same goes for tech. Like tech had, like for most companies, they had these consumer propositions, which were amazing. But during the life of the company, um, capital starts interfering. And then the proposition changes a bit and shifts from helping the consumer and the user be empowered to changing their life in a way that was controlling and, and not giving them the authorship of their own life story. So I, I thought of ways to mitigate this. And uh, after two years of researching, um, I found a lot and, and he helped me take it to a different place. And, and I thought, I think that's how we got to Darrow in a sense. We were thinking about how to use law to regulate tech in a sense, but then we thought of it in the other way around. Other way around. Let's use tech to build up law, to, to make good on its promise of helping people be the authors of their own life story, right? I love it. I just love it. If you had to think of how other people would look at Evia. How would they describe you in a few words? If I were to ask Elad or Gila or any other 40 Darrowers, who's Evia? What would they say? I think that the, the, like for Darrowers, it would be weird. That, that would be the word. Um, we use, in Hebrew, we use Yetzul or creature. <laughs> um, so, so I definitely am a weird person. Uh, I also think I'm a hopeless romantic. Wow. Um, I, 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 I haven't heard that before and I love it. I, I believe in what we're doing like from within and that makes me into uh, someone that's susceptible to uh, be disappointed when something bad happens and to be extremely happy when something good happens. So I could like, for me, that roller coaster of founding the startup is, is it's personal and it happens like every day, right? Every day when something goes bad or something goes good, th then I have those feelings and th they're strong. And I think like it's a life worth living. You wanna live a life where you, you really get like strong feelings about everything. So yeah, I think that that would be another word, romantic. Sounds like you sleep well at night. No, I do not. <laughs> not most of nights, yeah. But for different reasons. Yeah, for different reasons. For different reasons. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Ev, yeah. This was so, in so interesting and inspiring. Uh, and I just, I love these stories of, of leveraging tech to, in this case, bring justice, but to literally make the world better. I mean, it's, it's a nice phrase that people like to put out there, but then what you're talking about, the quantifiably being, being able to measure and having a succinct KPI that Darrowers can sort of have as a guiding North Star, helping victims and seeing how are you actually translating your work into helping them tell their story. I think that's, that's an amazing piece. So thank you very, very much. Thank you for having me, Michael. Bye-bye.